Hello, everyone. This is a book review of a book entitled Polyanity and subtitled Identifying Christianity's False Apostle. And uh, we did episode two where we were discussing the presentation by Farrell, the author of this book, that he was giving examples in the book of Acts of Paul obeying the law. This is episode 2.2. Uh, I'm deciding here to add these in here for a reason which I'll now explain. So I was not planning on doing any more discussion on that, leaving it up to you to read the book. But we now find out again, the book is censored even uh, yet again. Uh, and Michelle wrote me a few hours ago. She said, I was able to add the Pollyanna ebook to my Amazon cart, but on checkout was not able to purchase it. The message was, quote, not available in your area or something like that. I am in California. I tried on two different occasions. So uh, if any of you are able to purchase it in another state, uh, that's, that's great. Let us know that, by the way. But I'm going to assume that they wouldn't make this just for the state of California unless we have book banning in California, which uh, it, and maybe I shouldn't be surprised if that happens, but uh, I haven't heard of that uh, law coming out yet. So um, anyway, let's, uh, let's, so that's why I'm going to make a two, uh, episode 2.2 .2 to include things I was planning on skipping over and letting you read it. I think one of the things I like to do is preserve a work that is pretty rare, in this case, not even allowed to be read, apparently, uh, it, that we could preserve some of its main good points and its collection of good evidence. Whether he's interpreting it right or wrong doesn't matter. There, this is evidence that needs to be weighed in assessing Paul, so it's good to review. Let's begin now. Okay, so we're going to start uh, here at this point where he talks about the New Testament records that Paul also observed the so-called Jewish festivals, such as the Feast of Weeks. So he's going to, he's trying, Pharrell is trying to hear to prove that Paul's keeping the festivals. That means he's law compliant. Therefore, he's obviously doing it from a sincere heart is what Pharrell is saying, uh, unless you want to say, uh, say he's a liar. And he says he's going to talk about that later, but he's giving uh, Paul the benefit of the doubt and that he's going to assume, and, and he believes also that this is Paul's sincere position, that the Feast of the Weeks in this example had to be followed. Why else is he obeying it? Paul also insisted that his disciple Timothy be circumcised per the Jewish law. And I'm going to pause there. And it's very clear, we're going to quote it later, is it's not because he believes uh, in circumcision, it is because he was a, a fear of the Jews. So Luke tells you it's not from a sincere objective, but that he feared the Jews, and for their sake, he told Timothy to do it, and that means he was trying to make Timothy look righteous in front of those who were Jews, that they that they would think the, the rule of circumcision still applied, and yet we know in his epistles he doesn't believe the rule of circumcision applies for anybody, Jew or Gentile, since there's no more Jew or Gentile, and uh, let, let, let's keep going. So Paul also insisted that his disciple Timothy be circumcised for the Jewish law, and he even led new converts by example in taking vows in the Jewish temple. He repeatedly submitted himself to the authority of the Jewish elders of his day. And all of this is as it should be, for if, as modern Christianity now asserts, Paul thought that the law was done away with and had no value, then he would certainly be in contradiction of the teachings of all of God's prophets of old and of all the other apostles before him and even of Jesus himself. I'm going to pause there. So he's saying clearly, the Paulinists, you have a real problem because if you don't accept this version of Paul, that he's, a, he's endorsing the law, then you're acknowledging he doesn't follow the law and that'd be contradictory to God, the prophets and Yeshua, right? So it is actually a quandary that the Paulinist uh, is, is trapped. And so either they admit he, Paul's a false apostle and they have to reject him or they have to make up this idea of a new whole, whole new dispensation that Paul can dispense with everything Jesus taught. That's what Boltman said, you, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 5, verse 16. He said, when Paul says we... Once knew Jesus according to the flesh, but now we know that uh, him th that way no longer meant that this Jesus of the flesh, the one we're reading in the Gospels, is somebody we no longer pay attention to. That's what he said. That was his dispensationalism. And according to mainstream scholars, Boltman is, even though he's from Germany, all his works are being translated into English, sent into our seminaries in the 1920s, and he's considered the fourth most important theologian of the 20th century of his influence in our American culture and, of course, in Germany and pre-Nazi Germany. And if you ask me, he set up the German people to have no more morality anymore, and they could justify anything that the ruler said to do based on Romans 13.1, which was actually taught in school <laughs> in Germany leading up to the Nazi uh, takeover.
You can read more about this issue of the Nazis using uh, Romans 13 in uh, Haaretz, a, a paper from Israel called The Real Story Behind the Nazi Establishment's Use of Romans 13. The article begins in July 1933 during Hitler's first summer in power. A young German pastor named Joah Hickeen Ossenfelder preached the sermon in the towering Kaiser Wilhelm Memorial Church, Berlin's most important church. He used the words of Romans 13 to remind worshipers of the importance of obedience to those in authority. The church was festooned with Nazi banners and stormtrooper flags, its pews packed with the Nazi party faithful, including men in the brown shirts of the Stuhlmann. Blah, blah. I don't know how to say that. I just want to show you one little thing. You can read the whole article at, online. So when you get rid of Jesus, as Boltman said, we no longer want to care what that person th thought, Jesus thought. Uh, this is what you get, Romans 13. Let every soul be subject to the ruling archon. The higher powers is translated in the King James, but it means the archon, the rulers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resists the power, resists the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall, resist, shall receive to themselves damnation. So if you disobey the rulers, you disobey the Nazis telling you to kill six million Jews, you're a sinner. Get it? For rulers are not ter terror to good works, but to the evil. Tell that to Jesus. Tell that to John the Baptist. Paul, wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou, that, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. So the ruler, Nero, madman Nero, uh, uh, all the rulers that you're facing today in the world, they're all from God. They're all ministers of God to thee for your good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For the, he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon them that does evil. As that ruler defines and has redefined things. We're not, we're not talking about spiritual rulers. He's talking about the rulers of the world. Wherefore, ye must needs to be subject not only for wrath's sake, but also for your conscience sake. So you're supposed to obey them as if they are God speaking to you. Do you see this? He's put... He's put Yahweh, if, if 2 Corinthians 5, 16 means we no longer know Jesus in the flesh anymore, Paul has excused you from listening to Jesus, and now you can just listen to the rulers because they're, they're more authoritative than Jesus. And, of course, he got rid of the uh, Torah and Galatians and, and other books. So anyway, this is a, just a digression, uh, but it, it bears on this fact that what, what we're dealing with is a culture that accepted that Jesus is no longer to be followed and only Paul and ultimately, Paul directs us to only follow the rulers above us, the civil rulers, the archon. So this is what uh, Pharrell here at this page is saying. The, the Christianity would have to then get rid of everything Jesus teaches, everything in the law teaches, and just have Paul. And where does that leave us? So I, I just want to read it again. And if all this is as it should be, for if a modern Christianity, if as modern Christianity now asserts, Paul taught that the law was done away with, and had no value, then he would certainly be in contradiction of the teachings of all of God's prophets of old and all the other apostles before him, and even of Jesus himself. And yes, that's what happened to Nazi, pre-Nazi Germany. It was acculturated by Boltman's teachings for 20, uh, at least uh, uh, 15 years, and that's what you ended up with. And D Dietrich Bonhoeffer in 1939 wrote, we have now arrived at a Christianity without Christ. Those are his exact words in the course of discipleship. Many Christians read that and they don't realize what he's talking about. He's talking about dispensationalism of Boltman had taken Christianity out of, taken Christ out of Christianity. And all we had is this uh, uh, Paul and it had no law. Anyway, I digress. Let's continue. But that's important. We need to know the social ramifications of believing and trusting in Paul's teachings against the law. And I, I can see what Pharrell's trying to do. He's trying to get us to accept Paul was a law-abiding person to try to drive us towards uh, the law of obeying God. But that really doesn't work because we know that he contradicts that himself in his own epistles. Anyway. Okay, so now we're going to pick up from where we left off last time. And this is what Pharrell says about location 504. It is my belief that commentators simply refuse to admit the horrifying conclusion for them that Paul actually believed in keeping the law to the point of participating in animal sacrifices, even after his conversion. Pause. He's talking about the Nazarite vow involved doing these offerings that involved animal sacrifices at the end. That's part of the Numbers chapter 6 uh, provisions. So he's, it's shocking in a sense that we don't think about that those laws until the temple was done away with didn't go away. There were certain minor offerings for different things that you would do on a regular basis for sin that you've committed, just so you know. Uh, okay. Paul actually believed in keeping the law to the point participating in animal sacrifices even after his conversion and that their interpretations of his other writings are either incorrect or Paul simply changed his teachings along the way. 
Either that or Paul is a liar who changes the story depending on whom he's standing in front of. I'll examine that possibility more in later chapters. Perel continues. <clears throat> he says, Continuing on in the book of Acts, Luke records that Paul is also observing the so-called Jewish festivals required by the law, such as the Feast of Weeks, also translated as Pentecost in the English translation of the Greek Septuagint. We're told in Acts 20, verse 16, for example, that Paul decided at one point in his travels to sail past Ephesus rather than stop there and visit as he had planned for he was, quote, hurrying to Jerusalem so he could be there in time for the day of Pentecost. And this is the quote from Acts 20, verse 16, quote, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he would not have to spend time in Asia, that's Asia Minor, which is Western Turkey today. For he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. Again, modern Christianity would like us to believe that the only reason Paul wanted to be in Jerusalem in time for a major Jewish festival because there would be more Jews for him to preach to, and certainly not because he himself was actually observant of the law. But that is not what Luke records as Paul's reason for being there for the feast for when Paul is hauled before the judges, of in, Jer uh, judges in Jerusalem to make an account of himself for things they were hearing. This was Paul's response, as recorded by Luke, as to why he was in Jerusalem. When the governor had, this is a quote, when the governor had nodded for him to speak, Paul responded, Knowing that for many years you have been a judge to this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can take note of the fact that no more than 12 days ago I went to Jerusalem to worship. Not to preach, is what he's saying. Neither in the temple, nor in the synagogues, nor in the city did they find me carrying on a discussion with anyone or causing a riot. This is Acts 24, verses 10 to 12. Pause there. So Paul clearly is saying, I was not there to teach. I was not talking to anybody. I was not carrying on any discussions. I was simply worshiping. That's clear as a bell. Next, Pharrell continues. There are a great many things to deduce from this record in Acts. First, Paul still felt the need to come before the Jewish leadership and make an account of himself, even keeping silent until given permission to speak. Pause. Now that tells me one thing, that Paul knew the uh, leadership that Jesus had appointed in terms of uh, the ruling authority, in a sense, as what were all 12 apostles and through their representative, which was James the bishop. And so they were the controllers of obviously the, the, the what was canon, what was manuscripts. Of course, in those days, it was only the book of Matthew initially. And Luke's gospel hadn't yet existed. As you're going to see, it's going to come out of this. And Mark and... Um, and uh, John, John had yet been written for another 30 years, and Mark was an epistle that really wasn't given much attention at, at all in the early church. Although some people think it was the first gospel, but it, it actually wasn't, but that's a, a whole other argument. Okay, uh, then it says, he then acknowledges the authority of the governor in charge and cheerfully makes his defense. This is Paul acknowledges the governor's authority. Paul then proceeds to point out that he came to Jerusalem on time for the festivals 12 days prior to worship. In other words, he did not come to witness to Jews. He did not come to try and get new converts. He came up so that he himself could worship. Unless, of course, Paul is lying to save his own skin. Another issue we will, he said, we're going to deal with later. Continuing, Farrell says, either way, we are told that Paul specifically said he came to worship. He then confesses that he was in the temple, the synagogues of the Jews, and in Jerusalem for the whole time, and, no, and that no one saw him carrying on discussions, that is, witnessing, or causing a riot. In other words, Paul flatly denies that he was there to witness to anyone. Instead, Paul clearly tells us he was there to worship as a Jew and was attending temple and synagogue. Furthermore, Luke continues to record Paul's own words in his defense when Paul states, quote, Now after several years I came to bring alms, that's uh, charity, to my nation and to present offerings, that sacrifice, in which they found me occupied in the temple, having been purified without any crowd or uproar. Acts 24, verse 17 to 18. So again, Paul admits he came to Jerusalem to worship and even to present offerings in the so-called Jewish temple per the requirement of the festival, Deuteronomy 16, verses 16 to 17, and that he had been ritualistically purified, and he says here in parenthetically, parent likely via completing his Nazarite vow, according to the law. In fact, per the law, Paul was required to appear in Jerusalem for the feast. In other words, Paul clearly made a defense that he was observant of all Jewish law, had come there as commended in the law, and presented his offerings, which included sacrifices. Note the instructions for the annual festival. So it's going to give you the commands that he's referring to to make that claim. 
and he's quoting from Deuteronomy 16, verses 16 to 17, so I'll read that. Three times in a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses at the Feast of Unleavened Bread and uh, the Feast of Weeks, that's Pentecost, what Paul's dealing with or coming to Jerusalem for, and at the Feast of Booths. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed, Quote, every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. All right, so that's the end of that topic. I'm going to take a break, and we'll come right back. Okay, so now we'll deal with Paul and circumcision. Modern, this is Pharrell again, at location 564. Modern Christians are quick to point out that Paul often preached against the observance of the law, especially against circumcision, which was commanded of all Israel. Quotes from Paul readily come to mind, such as, quote, neither circumc circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, end of quote. And even stronger in condemnation, Paul says, quote, if you allow yourselves to be circumcised, then Christ means nothing, or actually says, does not profit you anything. And then he quotes this. Behold, I, Paul, say, and this is uh, from Galatians chapter 5, verses 2 to 6. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. You've been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, by faith, are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. End of quote. These phrases are odd considering the fact that Paul himself was circumcised and after his conversion to the way also had one of his disciples, Timothy, circumcised. That's in Acts 16, 1 to 3. So please listen carefully to what is the reason that Timothy does this. It's not uh, because Timothy is Jewish or his father's, uh, one of his ancestors is Jewish. No, that has nothing to do with it. Just listen. Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra, and his disciples there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman, who was a believer, but his father was a Greek, and he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him, why? Why? Because of the Jews who were there in those parts, and for they all knew that his father was a Greek. So in order to placate the Jews, Paul had Timothy circumcised, and that not because it was an obligation of Timothy, but instead for this reason alone, which, by the way, to me, that means Paul is not intending to do this to, to demonstrate that the Jews still have to be circumcised. He said there's no more Jew or Gentile. And that's what he literally means. There's no more Jew and Gentile, no more circumcision. Circumcision is nothing. So that's that's uh, his new rule. New rule, get rid of circumcision, if you pay attention. So we see that Paul himself takes Timothy to be circumcised. How can Paul possibly believe that if a person becomes circumcised, that Christ has no meaning for them, and then demand that Timothy be circumcised? Now, pause. That question jumps out here as not consistent with what he's been arguing up to now. He's saying, I mean, if you take these verses from Paul literally, yeah, how can he take two positions that are totally contradictory of one another? And the only solution is the, what we pointed out in the episode 2.1, where it was we showed you all these passages where Paul recommends hypocrisy. You know, if my if I by my lie the truth of God is brought glory, why am I still called a sinner? That's Romans 3 7, 1 Corinthians 9. He says, when I'm around a Jew, I act like a Jew. When I'm Around those who are not under the law, act like I'm, I'm act as if like I'm not under the law, although I'm under the law of Christ, and so on. These are just simply creating false faces to make people you think you are at their level, whatever it is, so that you can get along with them and bring in your doctrine, whatever it may be. That's not Christ's way of doing things. You have to have integrity in what you do. Why would Paul make Timothy do something he believed was worthless and obsolete? So now he's actually, I think, trying to question what are the book of Galatians true or correct using Luke. Again, if you discount the, the passage where Paul defends hypocrisy, you're missing the point then. You, you're not realizing Paul defended the very thing that explains what he's quandering about here. Worse yet, why would he have him do something that would sever him from Christ? Exactly. Why would he do that? Right. right? Paul claims to be blameless in keeping the law. So let's uh, let's take another break here. Okay, so we'll take a break here at about the 20 minute mark. And so we can just make these a little more bite sized uh, to go through a book like this. Uh, it might be faster to absorb it if we do it in 20 minute chunks rather than 30 minute chunks. So that's what I'm aiming for. So look for the next episode we call 2.3 because we're literally still going to be in this uh, context of what 
what were the proofs that Paul was following the law that uh, Pharrell was saying, see, so you can't, you have to just assume everything you see to the contrary in Paul is, has to be explained away. It's just difficult to understand language. And that's the 119 ministry strategy. So that's exactly what we have here. And we've, we had a long series on whether that's a right strategy or wrong strategy in examining 119 ministry. So again, clearly a wholesome try effort to try to do things, but it's, in my view, you have to just have uh, not go along with it because you can see between the lines, this is not what Paul's true view is. And therefore you don't want to be an accessory to deceit. And therefore we must expose these are efforts at deceit against Luke and uh, we should not fall for it. And that's exactly what it is. They're, they're frauds. And so we'll, we'll, but Pharrell's argument, at least he's making it sincerely and he's believing and giving the benefit of doubt to Paul. So that's an alternative sometimes to approach people who are difficult uh, Paulinists and, or whatever background they have, whatever uh, uh, value you can find out of it, just be sure you're not an accessory to uh, fraud. And so I would just say hypothetically or assume what you tell the person, you, you know, assuming what you think is true is true, you, you have a problem. Why does Paul say all these law obedient things? So these are very good, very good list here to get this down pat and understand it. All right, God bless. We'll see you on episode 2.3, continuation of this uh, topic.